So I'm very happy to and very humble to share with you some thoughts on intelligent formation system. And the case study that we'll try to use is cardiac rest management. And maybe we can bring up the slides. So my name is Gauss, as the famous mathematician, but I'm actually uh, an artificial and math stupid. I'm a dummy, so to the demise of my math profs in school. Um, my legitimacy to talk about this topic is, is rather limited, um, but it stems mainly from the work we're trying to do with a research group in France to set up an artificial intelligence enhanced trauma decision support tool. So, um, some of the things I present, for those who know a bit of artificial intelligence, and we have the pleasure to have a real expert here with us, many of there are other experts, so some of the things I will present are deliberate simplifications to stir up some discussion and to actually, thank you, and I uh, hope we have a lively discussion afterwards, and uh, some are deliberately uh, a bit controversial. So, you see, uh, great minds alike. I have the same slide as Richard, so that's first good point. It's not a buzz, it's a reality. The machines are amongst us, okay? It's not utopia anymore. They're deployed in lawmaking, policymaking, finance, engineering, uh, predict recidivists in uh, criminal offenders. So that's not utopia, it's reality. And want it or not, if you like it or not, we have to face it and we have to learn to deal with it. So let me cite Clemenceau as we agreed on some concerns and a big opportunity here. Clemenceau said, war is too important to be left to the generals. Well, I think as a non-techie that AI is too important to be left to the techies. Okay, So that's why uh, it would be great that we share some thoughts about this. Um, general thoughts it will not be a very technical talk because we have to seize this topic, as I said. If not, it will seize us. Let's agree on what we talk about. We talk about so-called intelligent information systems. That means that with the computational capacities that we have now, it's possible to converge, digest, extract, uh, and process a lot of data and generate probabilities. This can be done with so-called artificial intelligence, proper artificial intelligence, uh, for example, DeepMind, where usually they use neural networks to generate probabilities, so the machines work on their own. Um, as well as uh, more an array of complex statistical methods, uh, more like into machine learning, and uh, both of them generate probabilities. And if you merge them into a system where this information is then displayed in a user-friendly, ergonomic way, we could call this an intelligent information system. What is the rationale behind this? Um, I hope you agree that one of the most basic and most important skills that we have as clinicians is to put order into disorder, to identify patterns in disordered information. Okay, so um, small reference to Ludwig Boltzmann. Um, are we any good at it? We probably think we are. Um, who thinks he's a good decision maker? Okay, so well, I've. I've who thinks that he makes... I'm, I'm terrible at making order in my children's room, for example. The evidence shows that when you look at it, it's so-and-so. Probably we're 50% of the times right, 50% of the times wrong, for many complex reasons. Um, and one of the main theories that, that try to explain this is the so-called dual process theory. It stems from cognitive science. So we probably oscillate in the mode of functioning between the gentlemen represented on the left, more artistic, heuristic, intuitive, expert-based, and more to the right, gentlemen to the right, is um, logical reasoning, A plus B equals C. Um, and we use this as a cognitive toolbox, yeah? And very often we don't know which tool we actually use. So this makes our decision-making probably inconsistent. The machines, on the contrary, they're supposed to be consistent. They're supposed to be reproducible. Uh, they're supposed to have quantified analysis of data, the same data, in an understandable way. It's not some black box decision making. So, this provides a great opportunity. Let's call it data utopia, artificial intelligence utopia, as well as a big challenge, a dystopia to society and the medical community in general. So, let's look at data utopia and use out-of-hospital cardiac arrest management 
as an example, as a case study. What could this bring to you as a clinician, really, um, very concretely to your decision making? Datautopia could be a sort of cardiac arrest cockpit, where a lot of complex data is processed immediately, um, even complex data that you probably don't dispose of, um, and you show up on scene and the machine provides you an immediate ROSC probability or an immediate, uh, the most likely cause for the cardiac arrest. So this then displayed in a very ergonomic, user-friendly way, <laughs> comparable to a cockpit. If you share this information among all the providers in the rescue chain, and you heard about RETS yesterday, this will empower all the providers along the rescue chain. They will be able to talk to each other. They will be able to share information online in real time. And this will empower the decision making based on probabilistic decision support. <clears throat> and you can have the individual patient uh, data running continuously evolving and the machine is learning at the same time. And you can have population based data in the background to back it up and to compare it to a, large amount, to a huge amount of data. This is a great anti-fragmentation tool. We know that acute care is fragmented according uh, organizational, institutional, cognitive lines. So if people can share this information in real time, they can better anticipate, better share, provide input, and um, so this is an anti-fragmentation tool. It's also a great standardization tool because if we link this to evidence-based guidelines and procedures, then it's much easier to stick to have a cognitive, interactive cognitive aid that will make us do the basics right. And as Richard said, it's very, very important to first get the basics right. There's this work is a, a very interesting work from a group from a colleague from Lyon. They constructed a handheld digital cognitive aid and deployed it to simulated cardiac rest for trainees. So with a group that had the, the, the cognitive aid and one group that did not dispose of the aid. And you see it not only improved their technical performance, as well, it also is interestingly improved their non-technical performance. If you bring all this together, like decision support, the large amount of information that is automatically extracted and analyzed, this provides a new basis for targeted individualized medicine. And it's a great benchmarking tool. All the great work that Richard uh, presented, if you have this automatically extracted, put into data warehouses, this is a great way to benchmark your, your work and to have continuous automated output reports on key performance indicators. So Richard as well mentioned the, the quality of the chest compressions, which we know has been a confounding variable in the recent randomized controlled trials. Um, if we have automated and analyzed benchmarking of this indicator, it's much easier to control the confounder. We have automatic archives and documentation of our data reduces the redundancy and the, improves the quality of the data and there are no more paper PRFs that are patient record files that are lost or things that you cannot read or that are not recorded. So it's a great uh, way to archive and document um, data. And it will help us to analyze complex data that we're currently not able to analyze, like heart rate variability, which is a promising um, indicator of physiological deterioration. We were not able, we, we knew about this, there's nothing new, but we just didn't have the computational capacity to analyze it. And now with AI and artificial intelligence, it's possible. And that's a signal that as a clinician, we have difficulty to analyze. This is not utopia. This is reality. This is happening. So this is uh, a, an example of other startups. It's a startup from Copenhagen that's developing a decision support tool, artificial intelligence enhanced. And they say they have a much better rate to recognize cardiac arrest on the incoming call than the <coughs> experienced dispatchers. Interestingly, if you look at clinical trials, there are currently no clinical trials registered to look at artificial intelligence deployment out of hospital cardiac arrest management. Uh, and there are only 19 publications on PubMed, even with a complex search. And they most of the time deal with ECG analysis or rhythm recognition. So that was our travel through Utopia. Some of this is already reality and happening. Let's take our ticket to go to Dystopia. Um, you remember this gentleman, probably. Um, are the machines actually better to, do they perform better? 
Um, and it's we're really in the early stage, and people who know this well will say this will come, and the machines will become better. But currently, we have to say that they struggle as much with uncertainty and uh, and a large variation of data and variables as we do. So the known and unknown unknowns remain a challenge even for the machines. <laughs> One reason is missing data. Um, missing data remains a challenge even from large registry or in particular from large registries. So um, there are methods to imputate data, but it remains a challenge and, and machines need, need, okay, this, need actually a high level of quality of, care, of, of data and that's called what's data granularity. So the more specific the data and the more detailed, the better you can actually customize your solution to the system where it's deployed. If you develop a system in the US and you deploy it to Europe or vice versa or to Latin America or Asia, it will probably not work the same way. So you need a high level of data granularity. Uh, and this data granularity, a recent example, is the deployment of Watson. Watson has been deployed in uh, lots of hospitals, oncological hospitals by IBM in the world without any scientific evaluation. It turns out that if the data become wobbly and shaky, um, Watson actually struggles as much as the clinicians and it seems to generate contradicting or conflicting uh, predictions. Why is that? So in a very simplified way, and there's probably a lot to critique about this, about this uh, scheme, it's probably because there's a trade-off between the capacity, the predictive performance of the models, uh, especially of deep learning or neural networks that have a probably higher predictive capacity, but we really we struggle to understand how they come to the conclusions against machine learning that have maybe a lower predictive performance, but we are much more able to understand them. So there's a trade-off to make. Uh, and this is called the black box phenomenon. So um, there are many examples where the machines come up with very interesting predictions. They actually identify patterns that we haven't seen before, but we struggle to understand how they get there. And interestingly and ironically, the experts call this intuitive pathways. So we have an irony to our dual theory, uh, cognitive theory, and a black box as in the human decision making. One solution could be automatic data extraction. So, <coughs> is that the machines extract and suck in a lot of data from the environment, um, but you could imagine that they need a lot of data to be enabled to have the same amount of data at their disposal that a clinician has at his disposal. For example, in a regional cardiac arrest system, which poses a real challenge to technical compatibility. If you want to enable the machines to the same extent that clinicians are enabled by the vast array of information in their environment, you would have to make all the systems and platforms compatible to each other and be able to talk to each other. So that's possible, uh, and there are some already some works undergoing to improve standardization of data formats, but it's nevertheless still challenging. As challenging is probably are the cognitive, institutional, and regulatory silos that we have in, uh, that we live in to share this data and get access to this data. So from personal experience, I can tell you that it's not so easy as it seems. And this comes with the problem of scale. If you put all this into reality, this is actually quite expensive. And some people estimate the cost of such a system on a regional level, on a regional scale, to be about $500 million. This is equivalent to a new hospital. So there's a real policy change, a real policy choice to make between hiring uh, new health professionals, uh, uh, dying, uh, dying species in our health systems, or to, to pay for a new information system. Such a system will also be more interdependent, more fragile, and less resilient, as recent NHS cyber attacks have demonstrated. And will become a great and very powerful leverage to ration care and control expenses, which will probably then further the bureaucratization of care. There's a real risk about an increased bureaucratization of care. And um, this poses a real challenge for our understanding as professionals and of our model of professional autonomy and creates a conflict between professional autonomy and regulation. So imagine your GMC or your board then sends you a mail in a few years and said, well, in year 2022, you deviated 10 times from the artificial intelligence uh, supported decision making 
why did you do that? Or imagine a team is in the middle of a resuscitation and the uh, machine says, you should not thrombolize the patient or you should thrombolize the patient. You're convinced of the contrary, but the team knows what the machine suggested and challenge your, challenges your legitimacy. There's also a risk of cognitive de-skilling. Think about GPS. So it's, it's not a joke. <laughs> there have been data or there's some studies out there. People are not able to read a map anymore because they're so used to, to use GPS. So we learn by exposure and we learn by reinforcement cycles. So if we always have now this tool to uh, available, probably we get de-skilled and this will much more apply maybe to future generations who will never learn without any artificial intelligence decision support. And then there's the business model, okay? So we won't have time to dig into this, but I think there's potential conflicts of interest and the forces driving and pushing for AI deployment in medicine and in society is one of the main, main problems. And we, maybe we have time to talk about this in the, in the discussion. So you see, lots of potential for opportunity. It's really, it, it can be a game changer, but it can also be a game changer to take us to dystopia. So, what can we do? Um, what can you do? I think we should first of all, uh, and I hope this will generate some discussion and controversy, um, we should take ownership of this topic, all of us. We need to become at least, we don't need to become experts, but we need to become knowledgeable. That means we have to start the dialogue in our institutions and ask for AI committees. It's already happening, it's not the future, it's happening right now. So we need AI committees, we need ethical committees, we need to develop this topic and seize it. Um, one example is regulation. Not very sexy right now, but we need to lobby for regulation. Very old style regulation, I think. Um, because this will, they will be like medical devices. They are like drugs, they are like prosthesis. So they require very old fashioned regulation. And this regulation needs to be based on sound and rigorous scientific evaluation. And this probably we have to develop new methodology to allow us to assess the deployment of AI in medicine. And, um, and also assess what impact deployment of AI has on our, on our, on our professional behavior and of us as a community. Here we can learn maybe from the aviation industry and their sector approach. We have to accept finally that we are a medical economic sector and we have to work together as a sector. And um, to become a sector, I think we need to think about our relationship, our love-hate relationship to innovation. And I all invite you to read this great paper. It's only five pages long it's from René Albaverti and Mary Dixon Woods. I have a handout that I can send to you with all the all the literature and bibliography and things to read and summarizes my presentation. Is there a possibility if we manage to not have dystopia, to prevent dystopia, to actually go to utopia? And I think there is. And I think the way is to embrace and develop our human factor capacity as a clinician and within our institutions. If we develop our human factor capacity and the human factor approach, we can counterbalance or balance uh, maybe some of the effects of AI deployment. And we bring this together with AI. This will actually be able maybe to unload our cognitive buckets, to let the machines do what we don't do well, to do the redundant stuff, the stuff that bore us, the stuff where we're not good at. And when we unload our cognitive buckets, we have more space and time to become, again, great team players, uh, great clinicians, and to have a proper synergy between human factor and AI to have an enhanced human factor approach. So I hope that I st stirred some, some questions. And there are probably some simplifications uh, in, the, in the presentation. Uh, but I'm looking forward to the discussion. And uh, thank you for your attention.